Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. We thank you that you have called us here. We thank you that your Blessed Mother and our Blessed Mother is with us here as well to help us to receive. So we entrust ourselves first to her as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, present here on the altar, we acknowledge your presence just like you enter the upper room that Easter Sunday evening where the disciples were gathered, you entered through those locked doors to unlock the doors of their hearts. You came, Lord Jesus, then like you come tonight, still bearing the, those wounds you suffered on the cross, those wounds now made glorious those wounds of the passion now made glorious as wounds of love. We worship you, Lord Jesus, in those wounds of love that you bear even now as you gaze into our hearts. And Lord, that Easter Sunday night, bearing your glorious wounds, you breathed on the disciples the Holy Spirit you breathe upon us tonight, Lord, the very spirit of your heart, your Holy Spirit, that your life might be our life and we might share in your spirit of love. So we open our hearts, Lord, with Mary's help to receive anew this breathing forth of the Holy Spirit from your heart into our hearts. We'll start with the reading from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. This is what's present on the altar in the heart of the Lord Jesus is the same love, the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth of love that surpasses all understanding. It's all here on the altar in the Lord Jesus in his heart beating out of love for us, that we approach it now through the veil of faith. And our faith actually touches the mystery of God, the mystery of this love that exceeds all understanding. Our faith touches it. If we were to see the Lord as he truly is now, unveiled, it would probably burn us up, so great is the glory. But he allows us to encounter him now through the veil of faith. It's a grace. 
William Blake says, we're put on earth a little space to learn to bear the beams of love. That's what we're doing tonight in Eucharistic adoration, learning to bear the beams of love. Those beams of sunlight shining forth spiritually from Jesus' heart into our heart. We get to learn to bear those beams of love while we're on this earth. So we're ready when we see the Lord face to face in glory. And it's a mystery surpassing all understanding. The breadth, the length, the height, the depth. This love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. We're called deeper into this mystery. All right, that's why you came to this retreat this weekend. Put out into the deep. Deeper into this mystery of God's love. Deeper into the mystery of prayer. And when we find we put out into the deep, we often lose our familiar setting. We can lose our bearings. Right as you push out into the deep, as you push out into the deep of this ocean of love, you push off further from the earth. You no longer see the landmarks that you saw before on the land. You no longer see the lighthouse as you keep pushing out into the deep of this ocean of love. You lose your bearings. You're no longer in control like you were with earthly things. And when you push out into the deep in this ocean of love, sometimes all you can see is an ocean of love, not knowing where you are. And in those times, our only compass is faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and charity. Our only compass as we push out into the deep. Faith, God's goodness, he cares for us. He's guiding our lives according to his plan of love. He's really present and loves us, the compass of faith. He's good regardless of what seems to be happening or not happening. Hope, he's going to accomplish this plan of love for us. We can't see where we're going exactly, but we live in hope. Charity, maybe we're in dryness, aridity. It doesn't feel like love anymore. But we keep coming to the chapel keep coming to Mass, our faithfulness in prayer, living out the life of charity. Our only compass is faith, hope, and charity in this deep ocean of love that we're pushing out deeper into. Blessed John Roosbrook speaks of a rich wandering in super essential love. A rich wandering in super essential love a love beyond anything else we encounter on earth. Super essential. A rich wandering. You lose your bearings a bit, but you're caught up in love. A rich wandering and super essential love. The breadth, the length, the height, the depth, the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. That we might know this and be filled with all the fullness of God we just heard in Ephesians 3, right? And so to be filled with all the fullness of God is no little task. We shouldn't be surprised. There's going to be toil. There's going to be struggle in the life of prayer, in our Christian life. We're called to share more deeply in the divine nature, not just a, not just a natural end of happiness, and doing good in this life or world, but a supernatural end. To live among the angels, to be stretched beyond our natural capacities, to share in the very life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're surprised it's gonna cost us something. We're surprised there's toil and struggle and going deeper. You know, I love a certain type of soul. And just my uh, 10 days or so here in Trinidad, 
I, I feel a, a kinship that I've met a good number of this type of souls. You find them a lot around Eucharistic adoration chapels as well. And I'm trying to be this soul that I like so much more and more, something we grow in, right? I love souls who aim high and at the same time recognize their utter weakness and neediness and wretchedness and inability to attain what they're aiming for on their own. Souls who aim high, but know our misery, know what we're capable of, know that we can't do it on our own. Desperate, needy beggars before the Lord. And as Blessed John Roosbrook tells us, God turns no beggar away. God turns no beggar away. We come again and again before our Eucharistic Lord, longing for deeper intimacy, longing to be immersed more deeply in this ocean of love. But seeing how we fail, seeing how we stumble, seeing how we can't keep it up on our own and crying out, begging, begging, begging the Lord for more. Matthew the poor, a Coptic monk, notes that there are certain spiritual gifts that God wants to grant us only through much perseverance in prayer. Only through much perseverance in prayer, seeking him again and again. Certain spiritual gifts we'll only get if we do that. Seeking the face of the Lord steadfastly with longing in our hearts, aiming high and knowing our utter weakness. And this is what we love about St. Therese. She says she has the heart of an eagle, the eyes of an eagle, yet she knows her littleness, right? And our only hope is Jesus. Jesus is our elevator who can bring us to the heights that we can't attain to on our own. All we need is our trust, the vessel of trust, to receive mercy from the sacred heart of Jesus. We need to bring the Lord, this vessel of our trust to receive mercy and to do the little that we can do, to make the effort, even if it's just a little step, little things with great love, and sometimes we're not capable of even little things with great love. Well then, okay, little things with little love. Just do the little we can and bring the Lord the vessel of our trust. And his sacred heart will accomplish the victory of deep union with him. We don't give up. We don't give up. If we keep coming, thirsting for more, hungering for more. He turns no beggar away, but he needs our hunger. He needs our desire. He needs the vessel of our trust. He needs our steadfastness. He needs our perseverance in prayer. Then he can accomplish this beautiful plan of love over our lives. Aim high yet recognizing our utter weakness, to love the Lord. St. Francis of Assisi, he would spend days in his hermitage, crying out to the Lord as that needy beggar, that needy beggar, just crying out, ayuda me, ayuda me, help me, help me, God, help me. Right, the Franciscan order is budding up around him, and he has not a clue what he's doing. <laughs> he's not an administrator. He's never started a religious order before. No idea what he's doing. Help me, Lord, help me, that needy beggar. And Francis would also run through the streets like a madman. Love, love is not loved. Love himself, 
is not loved. He's waiting for us in the Eucharistic Adoration Chapel. Love himself is. How many don't stop by to visit him. How it wounds his heart. He wants more of us. Love. Love himself is not loved. And we all want to love him more. And it can be painful not to love him as much as we want to. Francis de Sales notes that that's one reason for the wound of love. One cause of the wound of love is that we don't love God as much as we want to. And we all here want to love him more. That's why you're here. And we know from experience that we cannot do it on our own. We know our poverty. And so we bring the Lord our poverty and trust. That very poverty can be space for God to fill with himself, with his love. That very poverty opens up space for the Lord as we bring him the vessel of our trust. It's a double abyss, the abyss of our neediness, the abyss of our poverty, the abyss of our nothingness on our own, and the abyss of God's superabundance. It's a good match. It's a match made in heaven. The abyss of God's riches and superabundance and the abyss of our neediness. It's a good match. He's enough to fill us up in our need. We bring him our trust and we keep trying. Little steps, big steps. Keep moving forward. We're surprised it's going to require toil and struggle to share in the life of God. And we can't do it on our own. We need the Lord to accomplish it. That's why we come before him in beggars, like beggars before him. We do what the saints did. Right? What does it look like to grow deeper into prayer? What does deeper love look like? There are many different answers in our world today about what love is. Is it romance? Is it a one-night stand? Is it finding all my desires met? Is it just happy day after happy day? You know, if you live in Tobago, you might think that, but not in Trinidad. You know the truth. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, love, love costs. And to grow in true love is to grow in the image of the crucified one. Right? God has to show us what love looks like. And he does on the cross. And we come to imitate, we come to desire to love like Jesus does when we adore him, when we come before him in the Eucharist, right? We become like what we lovingly gaze upon. Think of 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with unveiled face, beholding the Lord of glory, are being transformed into the same image. Grace upon grace, glory upon glory. We become like the one we lovingly gaze upon. That's why St. Dominic is depicted so often at the foot of the cross, gazing. That's why Catherine of Siena is in the Adoration Chapel, gazing upon the Eucharist, caught up. She's becoming like the light she's gazing upon. We become like what we lovingly gaze upon. If we can't love like the crucified one, spend more time with him. He'll win your heart. He'll win my heart. I don't have a chance otherwise. How much time should we spend praying each day to go deeper with the Lord? As much as you can. <laughs> you know, Our Lady of Fatima, her call to us is not simply to pray. You know, for a while I thought Our Lady of Fatima's call 
was to pray and make sacrifice. But her call is actually this, pray, pray very much and make sacrifices. Because many go to hell because there's no one to pray for them and make sacrifices for them. So the call is not simply to pray, but to pray, pray very much. Right? There's a bit of a difference there between the call to pray and to pray, pray very much. What does that look like? At least three hours a day, perhaps? Maybe certain seasons in life, you have eight kids running around, you can't pull that off exactly. But other seasons of life, really no excuse. Three hours, and it goes quickly. Daily mass, you show up 15 minutes early, you stay for 15 minutes of Thanksgiving, got an hour in. Holy hour, another hour in. You pray a rosary, half hour. Little prayer before you go to bed. You might even pray vespers, morning prayer, divine office. Before you know it, three hours, at least three hours. Pray, pray very much. I leave it between you and Our Lady of Fatima to determine what that very much looks like. Right, but there's no other way. We're gonna go deeper. There's no other way. We cannot do it on our own. And we don't truly know our poverty unless we spend that time in prayer. Unless we try our hardest and see how much we fail. Till we try our hardest and see how cold our hearts are at times. Then we know how much we need the Lord. And he fills us and he fills us. St. Francis de Sales, at the end of his treatise on divine love, gives us great advice. Last chapter is just one page, and it says everything. He says we need the academy of love. And what is the academy of love? It's Mount Calvary. It's the cross. That's where we learn how to love. That's how we're transformed into love. Now, I think our first reaction, if we're honest with ourselves, would be like, okay, maybe we need a course on Mount Calvary, a few classes on the cross, but really a whole academy focused on Mount Calvary as the academy of love, really a whole academy. Don't I already know about the mystery of the cross? Right? And we might think in our own little room, we might even uh, imagine, in a way, a diploma hanging on the wall from the Academy of the Cross. You've already learned it. You know what the cross is about. You know the mystery. But if you look closely at this diploma hanging on your wall, you'll notice that the signature is in your own handwriting. <laughs> it's we who think we understand the mystery of love and the mystery of the cross. The academy of love is a whole academy because it's not just knowing about the cross in a theoretical way, that's part of it, but it's about seeing our day-to-day -day lives in light of the cross. We all have struggles in life, difficulties in relationships, difficulties in our vocation, difficulties in the work the Lord has given us to do. Things get tedious over time. And when we don't see those struggles as our cross, if we don't see our struggles as our share in the cross of Jesus Christ, we're more likely to give up or to love half-heartedly. We need the Academy of Love, Mount Calvary, day after day, because it's about seeing how the mystery of the cross is being played out in our own lives day after day and laying claim to it in faith, right? It's not just Padre Pio who has a share in the passion of Christ. He has an extraordinary share, but we all through baptism, through offering ourselves at every holy sacrifice of the mass, we have our share in the passion of Christ. Not because we're so great, but because he's so great. 
And part of the grace that he wins for us on the cross is that even our little sufferings share in this great mystery of his redeeming work in our world today. He wins us the grace to share in his cross like that. We just have to receive it in faith, lay claim to it. St. Paul says, I die daily. Death to self, putting others first, beyond our own preferences. I die daily. You know, just a couple months ago, I looked up, well, what's the context of that? I imagine it was Philippians 3 or maybe Galatians 2. But no, I die daily comes in 1 Corinthians 15, the chapter on the resurrection, the new life. Right? This academy of love, which is the cross, is also academy of the abundant life, the new life that God has won for us, but that we enter into only through the cross. Again, right? It's a life bigger than us. So almost by definition, if you're going to enter into a life bigger than yourself, you're going to be stretched. You're going to be disoriented. Your own little plans are going to be frustrated. You're going to have to surrender. You're going to have to put forth the effort, even when it seems hard and not much is happening. We're being expanded to share in the life of God. The academy of love of the cross that we might enter into a more abundant life day after day. God's own life. And what's God's own life? Self-giving love. Why do we have to give away ourselves so much in this life in Christian service? Well, because the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are handing themselves over completely. The Father hands himself over to the Son, giving him everything. The divine nature, giving the Son everything except that of being Father. And the Son in the Eucharist, and on the cross shows forth that handing over of self. And as we live that out in our lives, we're caught up into the same dynamic. And we're brought into the life of the Trinity, which is all about handing oneself over to the other in the communion of love. We need this academy of love to, be go, to go deeper in prayer, is to go deeper into the heart of Jesus. And we find in Jesus' heart a tenderness, to be sure, but also a strength and austerity. What does this crucified love look like? What does this love look like that we're trying to grow in day after day? St. Bernard gives us a good example and answer. In his sermon on the Song of Songs, number 20, he says a perfect love has to be tender, wise, and strong. Tender, wise, and strong. And he lines up those three things with the three things of the first commandment, Deuteronomy 6, 5. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with the love that's tender, with all your soul, the love that's wise, and with all your strength, with the love that's strong. And how do we get a strong love? Well, by persevering through the difficulties in prayer, in life. You don't get a strong love just by, you know, walks in the park. It takes perseverance through the difficulties, right? So we all tend to begin with a tender love, right? But that tenderness has to go deeper often. Often we're tied to emotional consolations in prayer. We need emotional consolations to keep us going. And so for our love to go deeper in prayer and strong, grow stronger, we have to be placed in the desert in aridity, and to appreciate what the Lord is accomplishing there. He's making your love go deeper. 
And we can start with great fervor for the Lord, but our love also has to become wise. And for St. Bernard, for our love to be wise is for it to be virtuous, all the virtues coming together, not just times in the chapel, but virtues that we exercise through our whole life. Patience with others, mercy towards others, temperance, justice towards others, uh, prudence, courage, all the virtues that we work on make our love more and more wise, full of God's law, his plan, his logos. And this is a lifelong process, right? The thing is, we can often begin with a tender love, but sometimes we find older people as well, far advanced in the spiritual life, their love has become wise and strong, but sometimes it loses its tenderness, right? So we have to keep that tenderness alive as well, or rediscover that tenderness. Right, our life of prayer is not just like a military feat or a feat of strength, right? Our hearts need to be open, receptive, responsive to the Lord, tender to the Lord's touch. A strong love that hasn't lost its tenderness and is wise all the way throughout, right? And where do we find this love most exemplified? In the crucified one. In Jesus' sacred heart, the strength of love, he loves us to the end. He pours everything out. A strong love that hasn't lost its tenderness, right? It's a wedding feast that's happening on the cross. The wedding feast of the Lamb, wisely ordered according to God's plan. It's Jesus' heart we look to to have our hearts formed into this love that's tender, wise, and strong. And it happens over time. Over time, it unfolds before us. How can we grow in this way? Well, first of all, so two key things here, God's providence and the word of God. Very briefly about both of them to conclude. God's providence, right? God works on our hearts through every event in day-to-day -day life, through our relationships, through what we have to encounter, through the joys of life. He tenderizes our hearts. Through the difficulties, he helps us to grow in a strong love. Through day-to-day -day growing in virtue, he helps us to grow in a wise love, right? To respond to what's given at hand is how God shapes our hearts to make it tender, wise, and strong. You know, to appreciate God's love, we need to appreciate how he works through other people. Right, everything that happens in life that's good, that's true, that's beautiful, is, is a reflection of God and his love. Everything that we receive in life can be received as a gift from God and to receive it in faith, your relationships, your experience of love, tenderness in your relationships, to find in that an expression of God's love for you. Sister Nirmala, a missionary of charity, she was the first successor of Mother Teresa Calcutta, and she founded the contemplative branch of the missionaries of charity. As she's speaking about the, the virtue of chastity, right, we're all called to chastity according to our state in life. And she notes that chastity is all about love and that we live chastity well when we're convinced of God's love, when we experience God's personal love for us. And anytime we fall from this virtue, it's because where we're not experiencing we're not coming to contact. We don't have faith in God's personal love for me or for you. It's like St. Catherine of Siena says, the soul cannot live without love. The soul cannot live without love. 
And so if you don't receive love in a properly ordered way, order to God, you're bound to seek it in a disordered way. But as we receive love from God in an orderly way, everything is in place and we flourish. And so to have the eyes of faith that these little gifts throughout day-to-day -day life are expressions of God's love, right? Our souls can be like anorexic, sickly, going around, love me, love me, love me, love me, hungering for love, love me. But if we had the eyes of faith to see the sun shining as a gift of God's love, to see me waking up this morning, you waking up this morning, a little touch of God's love, the birds singing outside your window, receive it as an expression of God's love, your spouse coming to you with breakfast or doing a little chore for you, receive it as, yes, coming from your spouse, but also an expression of God's love. Then you do experience God's love and your heart is made tender and responsive to his love through other people. It takes great faith. Sister Nirmala encourages us to see the other as Jesus through the eyes of Mary. Why is this other person serving you in self-giving love? Well, because Christ is living in that person. To see the other as Jesus through the eyes of Mary, with the eyes of faith. You know, we can also see women as Mary through the eyes of Jesus, right? Mary is the perfect woman. Any attribute of womanhood, any a gift or character trait, beauty of womanhood, gives us a small glimpse of the perfect woman, Mary, to see the other as Mary through the eyes of Jesus, through the eyes of faith. Then our whole life becomes an expression of God's love for us as we receive it in faith. At Hosea, God draws us with bands of love, with human cords, with human bands, human cords, cords of love. God took on himself a human heart and he continues to work in our lives through other human hearts. We have faith to receive it. The divine love coming to us through the sacred heart of Jesus, through other people's hearts in this symphony of love that we live in. Last point. Another way that we receive God's love and have our hearts to be transformed into his own heart is through the word of God. God continues to speak fresh words to us from his heart. As we read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit lights things up for us as a personal word from the Lord, from God's heart to our heart. In the last discourse, Jesus says, John 15, 15, I no longer call you, you slaves, but friends, because all that I've heard from my Father, I have made known to you. And we might think like, how is that the mark of friendship? All that he has heard from the Father, he's made known to us. Well, it's the mark of friendship because Jesus is showing to us God's heart. We don't know what is in God's heart unless he tells us. And growing in friendship with someone involves a sharing of the heart, words from the heart, secrets of the heart. Jesus no, call, no longer calls us slaves, but friends, because he's opened up his heart to us, the heart of God. And this is the power of the word to bring us the other person's heart. You even just think of, of a human word. Human words have this power. If I describe something to you that's very dear to my heart that I'm very passionate about, if I paint the picture of something and through my words you come into agreement with me, there's a way in which my interiority gets inside your interiority. Through the word, through the word of the heart, I express my heart and it gets inside your heart and you receive it. 
And that's just a human word. Think about the divine word. God's interiority through the word gets inside our interiority as we're drawn more deeply into union with him. So on this feast of the sacred heart, we open our hearts anew to fresh words that come from the heart of God and fresh blood drops that come to, the, to us from the heart of God, right? The Eucharist, the blood of the cross has not grown old, has not dried up, has not grown cold. The blood is still moist, still warm from the very heart of God, living, beating, Jesus' heart beating still for us. The precious blood, his body coming to us anew day after day, fresh from the heart of God. New words from God's heart through the scriptures coming to us fresh from the heart of God into our heart, transforming our hearts, helping us to see the events of day-to-day -day life as God sees them, as his plan of love, to see our relationships, all the ways that God comes to us, to see it in a supernatural way and receive God's love. And so to let our heart be tenderized, to let our heart be filled with his word and made wise, to let our hearts be made strong with the very strength of God.